Hey, thanks for checking in. I'm going to cook a burger and fry some pre-cut french fries and having soda on the side. How was your day today? I'm glad you're here. Now let's talk about a comic I've been reading. It starts with a knock at the door with two former students, one with an ax, the other with the gun. They came to see their old guidance counselor named Mr. Locke who always tried to keep them from getting in too much trouble. Mr. Locke's wife <coughs> answers the door. Sam Lesser, the former students, mentions that Mr. Locke showed him a picture of his summer home at Willits, and Sam Lesser lied about coming over to just say hello. But Sam Lesser did tell the truth about staying with his uncle in Willits. Tragedy ensues for the Locke family where some survive and some do not and they are left to go to the family home called the Key House. Sam Lesser saw something in the picture of the Locke's family well house Someone is inside the well. And now that the rest of the Locke family are there, Bode, the youngest son, now hears someone calling from the well. Oh. Oh. This undead soul, disguised as a woman, and she needs a specific key. But there are many keys at the key house, like the key that when turned can make you fall dead and your spirit can travel. Or a key that when you turn it, you are transported to anywhere you desire. But what happens when Sam Lesser breaks out of prison to finish the job? And the undead crawls out the well to get to boat and there are more keys that do more things Joe Hill the writer talks about how he got the idea Joe says lock and key is about a haunted New England mansion full of enchanted keys. Every key unlocks a different door and activates a different supernatural power. I had written four novels that I was unable to sell. I was not having much luck professionally with longer work 
with the kind of works that score big readership. I had written a number of short stories, however, that had prizes and I got in best collections. And I knew how to write a short story. And on the strength of one of those short stories, I won the opportunity to write an 11 page Spider-Man story for Marvel Comics. And it was one of the big breakthroughs in my early career. I wrote it, Spider-Man came out, and I was like, I am somebody. I don't even think the comic is that good, but it was so much fun to write. It was such a gas to see the pages come in, see the whole thing get illustrated. And growing up, all my favorite writers were comic book writers. It was Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore, and Frank Miller. That's what I read, and that is what I really cared about. So, I was hungry again, and I sent Marvel a bunch of pitches and ideas. And at the time, I was a young father. I pitched them lock and key, and I pitched it to DC, and they passed, but I didn't pass on the idea. I kept thinking about it. And being a young dad, I would go on these diaper runs. And I would be half awake. And I'd be thinking up a new key. I would start to think of the new characters and the new situations. So I had a huge chunk of the comic in my head. And when I finally had a chance to do it as a series, after IDW Comics approached me about working on a project together. So that's how it started. It always was a comic, even before it was a comic. Joe Hill has written Spider-Man Unlimited number eight. Wraith. Strange Weather, The Fireman, Nosferatu, which became a TV show on AMC, starring Zachary Quinto, Heart-Shaped Box, Horns, which became a movie starring Daniel Radcliffe, Full Throttle, 20th Century Ghosts, which is a collection of short stories. One of those short stories is called The Black Phone, which became a movie starring Ethan Hawke. Dying is Easy, Tales from the Dark Side. Joe is working with DC Black Label with Hill House Comics, a new line of original graphic novels Curated by writer Joe Hill, who was the author of two of the first five titles, which are Plunge and Basketball of Heads, and of course, Lock and Key, that are six volumes. And then there are prequel short stories, with which is Lock and Key Golden Age. And now Lock and Key is collaborating with Sandman. Lock and Key was also adapted on Netflix as a TV show. Now Joe Hill's opinion on adapting his work, he says, I accept the story on the page is one thing and the adaptation will inevitably will be something else that expresses the interests and enthusiasms and focus of the creators who make that version of the story. A great adaptation won't make my story any better, just like a terrible adaptation won't ruin my story. It won't change a single word on the page. I try to be supportive 
and a kind of equanimity about what someone might do when they take the material because I've had my version of the story. I want to see a great director, a great writer do their version and see what that's like. Lock and Key went through several phases of development. For a while it was with Fox, later it was with Hulu, before it wound up with Netflix. Carlton Cuse, who did Loss, looked at the previous works and tried to puzzle out why. And it was almost like, you know, people had been turning the Rubik's Cube and they kept trying to unmix it to get it right. Carlton watched him work on it and then said, here's what you do. And he came in and gave it that last twist. And that's what finally brought Lock and Key together. The TV has drawn so much from the comic, but the comic book has drawn stuff from the TV show. We introduced a key in season one called the Matchstick Key, which can set anything on fire by touch. And I said, I love that key. And I thought I have to get that in the comic. So we stuck it in the latest run of the comic in the Golden Age series. Joe Hill says, I think the book that made me into a really passionate reader was The House with the Clock in Its Wall by John Belairs, which I read when I was 10 or 12. It had all these great illustrations by Edward Gorey in it. It's a terrific story of magic and wonder and loyalty and betrayal and secrets. And it's almost impossible to put down. That was my starting point as a reader. Joe Hill is Stephen King's son with works such as The Shining, It, Misery, and more. He says, my name is Joe Hill, but my full name is Joseph Hillstrom King. And I dropped my last name when I was about 18. I write as Joe Hill for a variety of reasons, but essentially because I didn't want to get published because I was a son of a famous guy. I was really insecure and I thought it was important that when I sold a story, I sold it because an editor was psyched. Not that I that thought, oh, his dad is someone famous and if I stick him in my magazine or if I publish his book, I sell a bunch of comics, which I think is sort of gross. One of the episodes of Lock and Key season two is built around a dollhouse of Key House. Like much else in Lock and Key, this dollhouse is magical. When it's activated with the dollhouse key, you can manipulate by moving things around inside the dollhouse. You can manipulate reality inside Key House. And a spider crawls into the dollhouse. And then in Key House itself, there's a giant spider scrambling around. And that's based on an issue in Lock and Key called Small World. And you know, while people often talk about my father, my mother, Tabitha King, is also a wonderful novelist. Her first novel is called Small World. 
about a woman who was shrunken down and kept in a madman's dollhouse. So I've learned at least as much from my mom and my mom's approach to fiction as I have from my dad. And it was terrific in both comic book and in the TV show to pay a little homage to her and recalling her work. At seven years old, I was in one of my dad's movies. I was in Creep Show. And I had one of those voodoo dolls that I poked it with pins. I was seven, eight years old and I was on the set for a week and I spent almost a whole week in Tom Savini's trailer underneath his work table, watching him disfigure actors with gross out makeup and build monsters. He was so cool. He had this leather jacket that was like a rock star leather jacket. The leather jacket of your dreams. And he, and he has these sculpted eyebrows like Spock, like Leonard Nimoy. And it was so great to watch him make these disgusting things and to hear talk about pus and stuff. And by the time I left, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wanted to murder people in creative ways and invent monsters. And when I was 12 and I had friends who loved rock and roll, so they subscribed to Rolling Stone magazine and who loved sports, so they subscribed to Sports Illustrated. I subscribed to Fangoria magazines, which was a magazine that dedicated to the art of gross out special effects like Tom Savini and Rob Botton. I just had this fantasy that's what I was going to do. In a weird way, that is what I wound up doing. I just wound up doing it on paper instead of with latex and Cairo syrup. Until you care about the characters, the story isn't working. Some writers are planners. They work from an outline and I understand that and respect that. I've never been able to work that way. I work from character. I try to figure out who I'm writing about. And then once I've got that down, the rest is easy. I just follow them from scene to scene and see what happens. I wound the character up like a little wind-up toy and set them loose and I just follow. I get my inspirations from jokes mostly. If something makes me laugh, then I turn around and I try to figure out why it makes me laugh. The special effects guys that I admire so much, they call really good, gross-out special effects a gag. When an alien bursts out of some guy's chest and sprays blood everywhere. And I always thought that was very telling because it's really not any difference between comedy and horror? You think there is, but there isn't. When Jason Voorhees picks up a mallet and bashes someone in the head, we scream and we cover our eyes. When Larry does it to Mo, we all laugh. It's the same scene exactly, it just plays for a different sort of primal reaction. So whenever I hear something that makes me laugh, I almost always turn around and deconstruct it because I always feel like there's a story there. Anything that's even mildly amusing might be pulled apart and reconstructed into a story. Gabriel Rodriguez 
the artist, has worked on Clive Barker, The Great and Secret Show. Little Nemo returned to Slumberland. Onyx. Gabriel doing the illustrations for Stephen King's fairy tale. H.G. Wells' classic science fiction novel adapted to a graphic novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Gabriel has written and did the artwork for Sword of Ages. And Gabriel has worked with Joe Hill on Tales from the Dark Side. And the artist and co-creator of all the lock and key books. Gabriel saying, I've been drawing since my earliest memories as a kid. And I've been in love with comics since very young. Having a chance to make a living at this is a dream come true. And I've been enjoying since day one. I started working with IDW since 2002. And since then I've been having the chance of working on fantastic different projects. And when I got the chance to start working in my first creator own work, which was Lock and Key, we got the freedom to tell the story we wanted to tell. And since then, it's been an incredible ride. I just met Joe and he told me about a story he had about a haunted house with magic keys and and they immediately thought I would be a good fit. And then I remember that I got the first two pages of the pitch of Lock and Key to IDW. I love the concept. I immediately did a couple character designs and Joe Hill loved them and when I got the first script of the story, I realized that was exactly the kind of thing I wanted to do for my first author-created project. It was really a magical thing that happened and allowed us to develop that concept, that story in that universe for six years in a row. We're very powerful and very grateful that we got together. Perfect timing. You want to get to the point of how to make the character tick and appealing to the reader. A couple years ago, I, I got an email from a reader that told me the best part of Lock and Key is that it felt like the characters were real people. And trying to get that from every story, that is the challenge. Gabriel Rodriguez talked about the relationship between Joe Hill and himself, saying, I think in our own way we're both crazy. And we get along really well. He's an insane guy out of control. And I'm a controlled, insane guy. So we complement each other really well. But beyond that, we love the kind of stories that we tell. We care about the same things. We love to tell stories about family and the personal conflicts in family relationships. We also love fantasy, adventure, and action. And insanity, and that's all in lock and key. We came together like creative brothers in the project and we got along really well. I've been able to consider my partners in long-term works as my friends and my family. Joe Hill said Gabriel and I went to San Diego Comic-Con in 2010. The comic had been going for about two years and there was no TV show yet. Up until that, Comic-Con, it was all just goofing off. It was just a bunch of guys making a comic book, having a silly time. 
And then a guy came up to get this comic book signed and he had the ghost key tattooed on his right forearm. And in that moment I thought, we are screwed. We're in trouble now. Because no one gets something from your comic book tattooed on them. Unless they really care. Unless it's really powerful. And it really affected them emotionally. And at that point, you owe it to them to deliver the best possible story. Lock and key. Check it out.